All right, so this is our first saw. And just looking at it, there's a few things to note. Look at the main emblem there. You're going to look down here in the corner, and you're going to look for a number stamped in there, as well as to see if you can see any sort of etching or engraving on the blade itself. Um, a lot of times the rust will be too thick, and you won't be able to see anything there. Um, a lot of older saws will also have a nib on this end of the saw as well. And now is not a bad time to take a look at the teeth, though that's something that we can address later on. Um, Looking at the handle before you begin to disassemble it, you want to look for any sorts of cracks in it and see if there's anything you need to be worried about so you can take extra precaution when disassembling it. Alright, something that's nice about this saw is that it actually has all of the split bolts intact. So and they're most likely the original, so including the emblem itself. So all these probably came with this saw to begin with and they're matching on the other side as well. So when we begin this dis disassemble it, we're going to start by just removing these on this side. A lot of times they'll be a little bit rust and you have to kind of force them through. Something you'll want to watch through for is with these split nuts, sometimes you'll have rust or gunk build up in the slot here. And as a result, you can't get a good purchase with the screwdriver. So you want to make sure that you take the time to clean that out if you need to. You can use a scraping tool, a pick. Um, I keep dental tools because they seem to work pretty well. But anytime you're unsure if you're going to get a good purchase, go ahead and make sure you clean it out and using a properly sized screwdriver. If you don't, what you'll wind up doing is flaring that area and you'll see a little bit of damage as a result of it. And that's something you want to try and avoid if you're trying to go for a res restoration. If it's a utilitarian saw, with, which is what we're doing today, it's not as big an issue, but it definitely does detract from the actual visual qualities of the saw once you're done with it. When you're removing the split nuts, sometimes they'll come up enough that you can pull them out by hand and you don't need to worry about using some sort of prying tool to, to pull them all the way out. Other times you'll run into the situation where they're just not quite enough where you can get a screwdriver on them. In the case that you can, you want to make sure that you're not digging the screwdriver deeply in there but laying it flat and really lifting up with it. The reason is, is that if you start to put a screwdriver into there and you start pushing on it, you're going to wind up marring around that mark, and when you actually finish this, you're going to see those screwdriver marks as, as part of the finished saw. Another tactic you can use is use something like a paint scraper to get up underneath if it's just slightly raised. This seems to be pretty effective for a lot of these older saws. The wider the blade, the easier it is to work it back and forth and really loosen it up. Something I also use is a screwdriver that's been bent and flattened on one side. And what this allows you to do is actually to lay it flat along the saw handle. So when you get underneath and you pry, it's on a longer surface and doesn't mar it as much. Turning the saw over, you can see that the split nuts are still left in there. So a lot of times they won't fall through and so you'll have to use a punch to push them back through all the way. Um, sometimes the handles are swollen and put extra pressure on them so they can be more difficult to remove. Um, you see a lot of times guys will use a, a, a hammer and really pound them through. I try to avoid that. Um, a lot of times it can just cause extra issues. It can ruin the threads and make it harder to thread them back together. Um, something to keep in mind is that if you are going to use a punch of any kind, you want the punch to be an appropriate size for it. So not too large that you're damaging the actual wood itself but large enough that you're connecting on a flat, even surface with that actual bolt. Now that we've removed all the split bolts, what you want to do is pull the handle off. And something to be aware of is that on saws that were made after the 1920s, they stopped having a cut that goes all the way back. So the blade is actually covered by a portion of the wood. So if we start pushing and reefing on this, it actually can split this along that seam there, even though it's not cut for it anymore. So a better way to do it would be actually to pull it off the back of the saw, or if you do find you have to rock it, rock it in an upward motion, separating it from the saw from the top, as opposed to what actually feels a little bit more natural, which would be to flex it from the bottom. At this point, we have the saw fully disassembled. Um, something to note would be the mark that's left by the handle. Um, if a saw has had a replacement handle put it on at some point, you'll often see a faint line that's slightly either inside or outside of the line left by the new handle. This is just one way to indicate whether or not it's the original handle for the saw.
Um, they did sell replacement handles. Um, some people made their own, though you can generally tell a handmade or homemade handle versus a replacement handle. Um, it just gives you a little bit more history about the saw. All right, now that we have the saw separated from its handle, we're just going to take a paint scraper and really lightly run it across the blade. And we're just going to lift as much as that light top layer of rust as possible without actually digging into the blade itself. The other side of it is done to show you the difference. So that's just with one or two pass with that paint scraper, and it does make a difference. Um, it's a good idea to avoid anything that might potentially leave gouge marks in there. So if you need to round the corners of your paint scraper, that's a good way to go. This is actually kind of a really exciting time because usually this is the first time, if you haven't can't see it already, that you're really going to get to see that emblem from the manufacturer. Now that we've gone over with the paint scraper, we can really start to see the etching from the manufacturer. Uh, you can see it's a D23 and you can actually see the quality of the etching. This is a good time to kind of make some judgment calls on how far you want to go with restoring this. Um, if it's a more valuable saw, it might make sense to maybe not be as aggressive about removing some of that tarnish on there as well. Alright, so I'm prepared to start sanding the uh, saw blade now. Um, what I'm going to be using is 220 grit sandpaper and then 320 grit. I've already put one on my block sander here. Uh, you want to make sure it's nice and flat. I use wet dry and then I just use some window cleaner on there occasionally and then make sure I have plenty of shop towels to wipe it clean as I go. Something I want to point out though is you want to make sure you're working on a nice flat surface. The reason is is that anything underneath the saw is going to create high spots. So you'll be sanding those high spots and you'll notice that as you go some areas become shinier and other areas remain dull or tarnished. Um, if you're noticing that it's always a good idea to move your blade around a little bit on your bench to make sure you're finding the flattest spot possible. If you have something like a large wood plane that you can do this on, that's a great option. Um, you can also do something like if you have a large piece of, of marble or granite that's relatively flat that you can use. Um, I wanted to point out that the last person used this bench left staples sticking in it. And that's obviously something that's going to create some issues. So we want to make sure you go through and you remove any issues on the bench itself, like these staples or this knot here could be creating a high spot. So make sure you're taking that straight edge, finding the best possible spot to be doing this. When we're sanding the saw, we want to make sure that we're running from what would be the handle side of the saw all the way to the front of the saw. Um, you see a lot of times they'll tell you you want to run with the grain of the saw or the cutting act direction of the saw. Um, there's a lot of different reasons they give for that. As far as I'm concerned though, for something like this, the biggest difference is, is that if you're running your sanding all the same direction, it tends to eliminate some of those hash gouge marks that you see um, and it makes for a nicer finish on the saw once you're done. So again it's something that is depending on what you really want to use the saw for and how much you want to restore it. Uh, something to keep in mind though is because we do have these etches in here we want to be very cognizant of when we're going over them with the sandpaper. It's always a good idea to avoid putting any pressure on them when you're going over them. You want to just pick, take that layer right off the top if you're noticing they're starting to fade, that's when you want to back off and assess whether or not you want to continue to sand those areas or maybe come in and do very light detailed sanding. Um, the other thing to do is to use something like a window cleaner or some sort of lubricant while you're doing this because that will allow you to see that etch clearer through all of the material you're removing. Alright, you can already see with only a few minutes of sanding lately that it already pulled off most of that remaining rust and scale that's on there. Um, point out though that as we're going here, we're seeing that etching mark <clears throat> a little bit clearer. We want to make sure that we're going to make a good call whether or not we're going to continue to sand if we start to fade or we're going to back off and leave that intact. Um, and it really depends on what you want to do with the saw. Um, at this point, it's getting on the verge of starting to fade. so. I'm going to leave that where it's at and not sand these areas anymore where those etches are. The other thing to keep in mind that when you're sanding down by the blade here, you want to run into these teeth and that'll just rip the sandpaper right up as well as your sanding block. What I like to do is get pretty close to it but not go all the way up to it um, and then at a later point come in and get a little bit closer and then finish it up just by hand with a small little piece. And that way you're making sure that you're not removing 
any portion of the tooth itself, you're getting in close enough that it's cleaned up, but also it, it means you're also not continuously running additional sanding over the rest of the saw where you might not want to. The 220 sandpaper is going to leave a little bit of these striations in the metal itself, so you're going to see some of that gouging from the sandpaper. Um, if you want, you can continue with the 320 and that will relieve some of that. Um, it's also a good idea if you're going to continue to sand around your engravings, you want to make sure you're using a lighter sandpaper. Um, you can see I kind of came in a little bit closer on these teeth down here to get as much of that as I could with the block. You can see there's some of these areas that are either low spots or really heavily pitted. And as a result, that sanding block's really just not going to do much more without removing a lot of material. This is where you're going to decide whether or not you want to continue with freehanding and removing some of it. If you want to do a, a <clears throat> couple passes with a finer sandpaper to remove some of those gouge marks, or if you just want to clean it up and leave it where it's at. All right, so now that I've got the blade where I want it as far as sanding, I've gone ahead and just used some paint thinner to clean it up, make sure there's no particles or dust or anything left on there. And at this point, I'm just going to use just some paste wax. I'm going to apply it to it both sides, let it hang dry out, and continue to apply just a few coats of that and kind of buffing in between it. Um, once I have a good layer of that paste wax on there, then that's about all I'm going to do for this until I get ready to sharpen it. I want to talk about the handle for a minute. The newer handles that you saw after the 1920s tended to be a little bit different than the previous handles. They tended to be blockier, most of them were machine cut at that point, and they didn't quite have the same feel to them. If you notice this one, the handle's a little bit big for my hand if I'm going to hold it in a traditional way with my index finger pointing forward. And you also don't have the same recess for if you're using different holds on the hand, on the handle itself. The other thing is, is that the way the blade fits in there, this portion up top here actually covers a portion of the blade. Um, that was a feature they added. Um, the earlier editions of handles used to have a slit that ran all the way through for fitting the blade in. And just to give a little bit of comparison, this is a handle from an earlier generation of the same series of saws. And you'll notice a few things. This one, the newer ones, had more split nuts on them to begin with. Also, the configuration for how they're laid out, the overall length on the saw blade itself. You'll notice that the way the handles cut is actually different as well, and this was to allow for different types of grips when you're sawing. Um, the horns themselves tend to be a little bit more long. You'll notice this handle is actually in pretty bad shape. However, it does actually have a much better feel to it, even in the condition it's in. Um, it's a little bit more rounded than the blocker your edges of the machine cut, and you can definitely feel a, a difference between a machine cut handle and one that would have been hand cut or at least partially hand finished. All right, looking at our handle now, we're gonna kinda of identify some issues that we need to address. One of the things we wanna look for is to see if there's any sort of splitting or cracking that's occurring at any point along here. Um, you might see it on the outer edges of it where it contacts the saw. You might see it running up top here where it's become loose and as the handle flexes against the saw, it causes it to split. You'll see the horns on a lot of older saws tend to be broken or partially missing. Now there are steps you can do to restore those or glue them back, but that's something we're not going to be covering right now. You will also tend to see splitting that occurs inside the handle itself, and that's something that will lead to where it will break in thinner areas. Um, the other thing to do is, is identify the condition of the finish on there. You can see the varnish on here is mostly removed in a lot of the surface areas and then it still is in some of the areas that weren't quite as exposed as much. Uh, there's also some darkening of the wood here that's likely from water and that's going to affect that color of the wood as we remove some of this varnish that's on there. So the big, best thing to do is start just with a light brushing of it, remove whatever light scale and dirt material you can. Uh, when you start to sand this you want to make sure that you're removing the amount of material you want to remove and not removing too much of it. Um, it's pretty easy to remove the varnish fairly quickly. Um, the one of the things you can use first is a paint scraper to help lift some of that out. All right, after taking the paint scraper to it, you can already see that most of that surface varnish is gone. Um, inside the handle on the curved surfaces, I won't use it because it'll tend to gouge the handle, which I want to try to avoid as much as possible.
Um, next, I'm going to start with some sandpaper. I'm going to probably start with a 220 grit and then most likely go to something like a 120 or 150 just because it's going to take a little bit heavier sandpaper to remove some of this varnish. Um, when doing these curved surfaces, it can be very hard to get into these crevices in here. Um, and one of the things you want to make sure is that on this point here, that you're sanding it in a way that's not going to weaken that edge. So you want to try and keep that edge nice and straight if possible. And sometimes it requires you to remove a little bit of material to make that happen. Um, the other things to keep in mind too is that you have the carving into it here and that's something that you're going to want to make sure that you're removing any dust and dirt before you go to finish this in any way. Um, I always do that after sanding. I will use a dental pick to lightly loosen up any material that's stuck in there and around these. Alright, at this point we're done with all the sanding. We've removed all of the old varnish on the handle. Um, I went ahead and used a dental pick to get in between all these little crevices and cleaned everything out. Um, you'll notice that there's two different colors to the wood here. It's more distinct on this side. And that's the result of being immersed in water for too long. Um, I'm just going to use some paint thinner to go ahead and clean up all the dust and everything on there before I do any treatment to the wood itself. At this point we have the handle cleaned up. We've used a little bit of paint thinner to remove any dust and particles that are left behind on it. I'm just going to show that right here there's actually someone's encarved their initials. Uh, I happen to know where the saw came from and because of that I'm going to leave those initials there. I could also try to sand out a little bit more of this dark coloring but it seems to be pretty deep. There's only a few areas that lightened up with some sanding. So as an alternative, what I'm going to do is actually try to match it a little bit. Um, the result of this being submerged in water with metal in the water caused it to turn this darker color. So what I'm going to use is distilled vinegar that I've soaked a, a pad of steel wool in. You can see that just with one coat of the vinegar and steel wool finish on this. You've already blended all of this into a one more uniform coating. You can still see some areas that are just slightly darker than other areas, but I really like the fact that we're kind of matching it together. Now at this point I can just finish it with some paste wax or I could use something like boiled linseed oil and do a couple applications of that. All right, after the boiled linseed oil finished drying on the handle, I went ahead and reassembled the saw. As you can see, this is a very functional Distin D23 and is ready for use. I went ahead and just used a little bit of Brasso to clean up the tarnish on the split nuts and the emblem. And you can see that our vinegar steel wool stain really evened out the color on that handle. 